And thank you, Triple S Choir, for leading our worship today. Good morning, First Baptist. If you would take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12. The Gospel of Matthew is all about Jesus bringing the kingdom of heaven near unto you and unto me. In the process of bringing the kingdom of heaven near unto us, it might be surprising to know that Jesus faced opposition. It's always been a little bit amazing to me that in order for for God to become flesh as he did, and in order for him to come to this earth as he did, that, that he would face opposition. Isn't it amazing that God would desire to come and appear to us face to face, and in the course of that, he would face opposition from the likes of us. Nevertheless, Jesus faced constant opposition as he sought to bring the kingdom of heaven down to earth so that it would be near you and near me. This morning, Jesus continues to face opposition in Matthew chapter 12, eight verses this morning from the Gospel of Matthew as we take this journey with Jesus as he brings the kingdom of heaven down to us. I'm going to ask you this morning, if you would, in honor of the word of God, if you would stand with me as God speaks to us and reveals himself to us in Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, at that time, Jesus passed through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick and eat some heads of grain. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath. He said to them, Haven't you read what David did when he and those who were with him were hungry? How he entered the house of God and they ate the sacred bread, which is not lawful for him or for those with him to eat, but only for the priests? Or haven't you read in the law that On Sabbath days, the priests in the temple violate the Sabbath and are innocent. But I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, it is our earnest desire, it is our heartfelt desire to live our lives in your kingdom. Continue to show us and teach us today, Father, through your word, what it means to live as kingdom people, people of the kingdom of God, people of the kingdom of heaven. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated this morning. Not only did Jesus face opposition as he came to bring the kingdom of heaven down to us, but when you look carefully at Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 to 8, you see that there really is evil present in these verses. Now, it it may not be the kind of overt, in-your-face evil. It might not be ISIS kind of evil that is readily apparent and, and is obvious. But nevertheless, there's evil present in these verses. And really, in some ways, the evil that's present in these verses is worse than outright, overt, in-your-face evil. Because this kind of evil that is present in these verses is, is the perversion of good. And sometimes that is more deceptive. Sometimes that's more tricky than outright overt evil. And and that's what Jesus is facing here in these verses. The evil that is present here is the evil of legalism. This is legalism. And and legalism is the idea, the concept that, that you and I in some way that you and I somehow can gain the kingdom of heaven through some effort, any effort of our own. Again, the idea of legalism is the idea that that you and I can gain the kingdom of heaven in our own strength and in our own power through some effort of our own. This is legalism. And legalism was a persistent enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ. As he carried on his ministry of grace, as he sought to bring the kingdom of heaven down to us, legalism was a persistent enemy because the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is a gospel of grace. It is a gospel of mercy, and that stands in opposition to the very idea and the very concept of legalism. Here in Matthew chapter 12, the story is quite simple. On this particular day, Jesus and his disciples were traveling. And and as they were traveling, they got hungry. There's something about travel that makes us hungry. I don't know if you're like me, but when I take a road trip, my, my thought 
the thought that's in my head is, you know, where are we going to stop next and eat? There's something about traveling that just makes us hungry. Well, if that's true for us, it certainly was true for Jesus and his disciples because uh, they were traveling the hard way. They were on foot. They were hoofing it. And, and they got hungry. And so verse 1 says, at that time, Jesus passed through the grain fields on the Sabbath. And I'm sure they thought, finally, at last, this is our rest stop. Hallelujah. God has led us right to this place. We're walking down the road and we're traveling and we're hot and we're dirty and we're dusty and we're hungry. And look, right here, God has, God has put a 7-Eleven for us right here, right out here on this road. And it was perfectly legal at that time for people who were traveling. It was perfectly legal for them to borrow a little bit of food from their neighbors as they were walking down the road. Everybody did it. That's how they, uh, that's how they ate as they traveled. And, and so... Jesus passed through the grain fields on the Sabbath. And the Bible says his disciples were hungry and they began to pick and eat some heads of grain. Mm -mm. Not exactly what I want as I'm traveling, but hey, to each his home, that's what they ate and that's what they wanted. And there they were traveling down the road and there's a field of grain. And so they began to take a little snack from the field. All is good so far, but notice the detail that all of this took place, verse 1 says, on the Sabbath, and there is the rub. The rub is the particular day of the week. And so verse 2, when the Pharisees saw it, when the Pharisees saw the disciples of Jesus taking a little rest stop in the field, eating a little bit of grain, when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath. So the Pharisees are taking all of this in, and they see what happens, and they did what legalists do. They hollered, and they said, ha, we got you now. You're wrong, and we are right, and we like the fact that you were wrong because in some way, shape, or form, that makes us feel a little bit better about our pitiful lives. You're wrong, and we're right. And maybe it is that they did a little superior dance at that point. The Bible doesn't say, but that certainly is the feeling. They felt totally superior to the disciples of Christ. They had caught them. They had captured them. They, they caught them in the law, and they delighted in calling attention to Jesus' disciples' violation of the law. This led to a conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees over the issue of legalism. And this is really not surprising because every time Jesus came face to face with the Pharisees almost, he entered into some kind of conflict, some kind of dialogue with them over the issue of legalism because the Pharisees are the quintessential legalists. Again, legalism is the idea that we can gain favor with God by keeping the law that we can gain favor with God by perfect obedience to the law. And when Jesus confronted the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 12, when he confronted them with the truth, listen, he exposed them. He totally exposed them. He exposed their evil. He exposed their error. He demonstrated their complete and their utter inadequacy. And on this day, Jesus confronted the Pharisees in his usual way. He began confronting them in verse 3. He said to them, and I love how he begins this, Haven't you read? Well, that's kind of a little, that's kind of a little slap in the face to the Pharisees. Sometimes Jesus would confront people by saying, Haven't you heard? But to the Pharisees, he says, Haven't you read? Why? Because the Pharisees were among a select few people who could read before the church of the Lord Jesus Christ taught the whole world how to read so they could read the word of God. Jesus begins confronting the Pharisees by saying, haven't you read? Of course the Pharisees had read. The Pharisees read everything. But listen, here's the truth about their reading. The Pharisees were more committed to their own traditions than they were to what they read in the word of God. Now, let me repeat that. The Pharisees were more committed to their own tradition, to their own beliefs, to their own understanding of the world than they were to what they read in the Word of God. And this confrontation between Jesus and the Pharisees, what did it do to the Pharisees? It just served to make them more angry. They just got 
angrier and angrier as time passed. And the Bible tells us ultimately they got angry to the point of execution and murder. Here's a lesson about our world. When the light of truth exposes the evil of darkness, the darkness gets mad. We do well to remember that in our world today. We do well to remember that in the culture in which we live today because there's a lot of darkness in our world today. And a lot of that darkness that is there in the world today is angry and it's bitter. A lot of darkness in the world today has taken up signs and taken up banners and even taken up arms and marches and protests and murders in bitter anger. So the Pharisees once again found some little cause to attack Jesus. Some little perceived violation of some petty law. And they used it to attack Jesus, to attack his character. They're demonstrating the action of the quintessential legalist. This is legalism at its absolute worst. What defines the quintessential legalist? What is legalism? Well, legalists insist that everyone do exactly as they do. Legalism and legalists, they insist that everyone see the world as they see the world. They insist that everyone believe as they believe. They insist that everyone do exactly as they do because they are right. Always. This is quintessential legalism. Legalists also delight in discovering wrong. They absolutely love to discover when someone has fallen victim to sin. They they absolutely love to see someone commit a sin because then they're able to, to, to to discover that wrong and bring it to light. Legalists delight in discovering and publicizing the wrong of others. Is that really something that ought to be delightful to us? When people fall victim to sin, when people commit uh, disobedience to God, is that something we ought to celebrate? Is that something we ought to delight in? Legalists also add to the law. They're constantly adding to the law. They're adding more laws and more laws and more laws. They can't get enough laws. And the quintessential legalist wants to apply the law to every possible situation and every possible detail of life. At this time when Jesus was bringing the kingdom of heaven near to you and to me, uh, the laws had expanded to such a point that there was one law that forbade people to spit on the ground on the Sabbath because if they spit on the ground and somehow rolled the ball, this is true, somehow rolled the ball of spit with their foot, they would be guilty of plowing. That's what the quintessential legalist does. They add to the law. They want to cover every possible situation and circumstance in life. Another law forbade a woman to look in the mirror on the Sabbath lest she see a hair on her face and be tempted to pluck it. This is legalism. The legalist wants more laws and more laws and more laws so there will be more lawbreakers for them to catch and exclude. By the way, we live in a culture that is thoroughly legalistic. Our nation is thoroughly legal. Do you know how many laws there are in the United States of America? Do you know how many laws there are in all the states and all the jurisdictions? I was really hoping somebody knew because I don't. But it's a lot. Too many. And the quintessential legalist loves to add to the law. Quintessential legalist always ignores exceptions to the law, and there are often exceptions to the law. And Jesus takes up the case here of his his followers, and he points to three possible exceptions that would make it perfectly acceptable for his disciples to eat the grain from this field as they were traveling. He points to the example of David. He points to the fact that, that priests could could work on the Sabbath because they were serving the Lord. And and if those two don't work, if those two exceptions don't work, Jesus says to, to the Pharisees, I am the Sabbath. How about that exception? I am the Lord of the Sabbath. I'm the God of the Sabbath. I think that accepts me. But the legalist always ignores exceptions to the law. The legalist always gets caught up in the minutia, the tiny details of the law. 
Work, as you know, was forbidden on the Sabbath, and, and that's what this controversy is all about. But listen, the rabbis and, and, and the Pharisees of the first century had divided work into 39 different categories so that they could define what was work and what was not work. Details, minutia, hair splitting. Three of the categories of work were picking, threshing, and winnowing. Now, technically, as Jesus' disciples entered this grain field and borrowed some of the grain from, from the grain field, they would, they would pick the grain, they're guilty of picking, and they would take the grain and put it in their hands and they would rub it around to separate the, the grain from the chaff, the wheat from the chaff. And so in that act, they were, they were not only picking, but they were uh, winnowing and they were threshing as well. And so, and so the Pharisees have, have busted Jesus' disciples on three accounts because of the hair splitting that they've done with the law and how they get caught up in the details and the minutiae of law. This is legalism. And the legalist, listen, this is, and this is the worst. And this really, is, this really is central. The legalist always, always, always misses the heart of the law. We might say that the legalist misses the intent of the law. Or, or we might talk about the spirit of the law. Every law that is given in Scripture, every law that is given in the Old Testament was given to the people of God to protect and to encourage their relationship with Almighty God. Every law that was given was given so that the people of God could relate to their God personally, so that they could love Him and trust Him and relate to Him as a person relates to their Father. Every law that was given was given for that reason. But listen, that just went right over the heads of the, of the Pharisees. They weren't concerned about their personal relationship with God. They weren't concerned about relating to him personally. They weren't concerned about loving him and trusting him. They were concerned about the law, following the law. The law became an end in and of itself. They forgot about the intent. They forgot about the heart, the spirit of the law, which was to encourage that personal relationship with their creator. This is legalism. And ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, the disease of legalism has not been eradicated from the face of the earth. Even 2,000 plus years after the grace-filled ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, legalism has not been eradicated from the face of the earth. Legalism continues to be, to this day, the persistent enemy of the very idea of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. And once again, legalism is the idea that we as human beings can do something, that we can do anything in our own power to earn God's favor or to earn God's love. It's the idea that we can somehow work, that we can somehow earn, that we can somehow buy our way into the kingdom of heaven. I remember in my own personal pilgrimage coming to grips with the full extent of grace and what grace is. I remember distinctly finally coming to the point of thinking, you know, if there is anything that I can do to work myself into the kingdom of heaven, then what does that say about the kingdom of heaven? If I can get in there in my strength, in my power, in my wisdom or lack thereof, then what kind of place is the kingdom of heaven really? Listen, if I can in any way work my way into heaven, then heaven isn't very heavenly. If I can afford to buy my way into heaven, and heaven's pretty cheap. And that's what legalism says. That's what legalism is. And listen, legalism, this idea, this broad concept, legalism to this day is the foundation of the religions of the world. Every single one of them except one. Every single one of them. 
is based on legalism. Muslims hope that they somehow can work their way into heaven. They believe that their scripture tells them the only way they can know for sure that they go to heaven is to strap explosives around them and blow themselves up in the name of jihad. That's why they're so willing to do it. It's the only way they believe their scripture teaches they can go to heaven. Sikhs across the face of the world work and they do and they do and they do for merit in the eyes of God. Millions and billions of people place their hope in their own effort. H.A. Ironside was occasionally interrupted during his sermons with an objection from the crowd and people would say, Dr. Ironside, there, there are hundreds of religions and nobody can really determine which way is the right way because there's hundreds of religions. And Dr. Ironside would answer by indicating that he knew of only two religions. There are only two. One, he would say, covers all of those people who expect salvation by doing. The other, he would say, covers all of those people who have been saved by something that has already been done. And so it is. The two religions of the world. Those that preach and teach salvation by doing and those that preach and teach salvation by what Jesus has already done. Only faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is based on unmerited grace. Unmerited means we don't work for it. Unmerited means we cannot work for it. Unmerited means we have done nothing to merit it. But listen, if we're not careful, even as recipients of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, even as those who believe in salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, we can wind up living the Christian life by being practical legalists if we're not careful. We're all born with the idea that we can do something to earn the favor of God. We can do something to work for the kingdom of heaven. but we're helpless to work or earn God's favor. Sometimes, though, legalism can creep into our faith. We can begin thinking, if I pray enough, if I give enough, if I study enough, if I worship enough, if I read my Bible enough, I'll become more acceptable to God. Legalism can creep into our faith Our relationship to God, legalism can creep into our relationships with other people. Jesus uses the phrase here in verse 7. He said, if you would have known, you would have not condemned the innocent. And legalism can creep its way into our relationship with other human beings to the extent that we might be guilty of condemning the innocent. Johanna Reardon wrote this. She said, when our children were young, my husband and I decided that we wouldn't watch R-rated movies. That's a good decision to make. We all ought to make that decision. She said, but we made this decision in good conscience, and we never regretted it. She said, I found out, however, that it made me feel judgmental toward other parents who watched R-rated movies or, or maybe just didn't have a rule that they wouldn't. I began to feel that they weren't fully committed to Christ because they watched things that I had purposefully decided not to watch. Reardon said, I realize how ridiculous it is to judge someone's relationship with God by what movies they watch or don't watch, but my evaluation was so subtle at the time. She said, as I made this judgment, I never thought about my own sin. I completely overlooked my own sin, my own shortcoming. I never thought about all of the things that the person I was judging might be doing right in their relationship with the Lord. Instead, I focused on this one thing, on this one violation of my law. I focused on this one thing that I thought they were doing wrong. Reardon said, being a Pharisee is so easy. She said, it's great to make rules, to have standards, that guide our own behavior. But when we extend those rules to everyone around us and insist that they think and believe and see and act exactly as we do, we're in danger of becoming the Pharisees, thinking that we are their judge. 
And so it is that legalism can surface even in our walk with the Lord. Legalism can cause us to demonstrate in our own lives a lack of love towards others. Legalism can lead to spiritual pride as we think that we're being obedient to the law and we are somehow better than others. Legalism can lead us to just have a lip service kind of faith when we're so focused on the law and yet neglect this relationship with God, the personal relationship with Him. Legalism, we know, can cause us to focus on man-made rules rather than on the Word of God. Legalism can lead to hypocrisy and legalism ultimately can lead to spiritual blindness. And that's exactly where the Pharisees were spiritually blind and spiritually bankrupt sometimes all too often perhaps we may be in some of these same places places that legalism leads us to and Jesus in these verses didn't just expose the blindness and the bankruptcy of the Pharisees. He didn't just challenge their thinking. He challenged their world. He turned their legalistic world upside down. He said in verse 7, If you had known... That's a slap on the other cheek of the Pharisees. Haven't you read? If you only knew. If you had known, if you understood what you were reading, if you really got it, if you had just known what this one phrase means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. If you just really knew the truth, If you would just get it, you would know that what God wants is mercy and grace and faith and love from you, not sacrifice and not rigid adherence to some foreign set of laws. Jesus quoted the Old Testament, another slap in the face to the Pharisees. It was their Bible they claim to be such scholars of. If you just known the truth, he quotes Hosea 6.6. 6. This is the second time that Jesus has quoted this particular verse in the Gospel of Matthew alone. This verse must be important. The concept must be all important to knowing what Christianity is. What does this verse mean? I desire mercy and not sacrifice. In its simplest form, it means just this. Mercy trumps legalism. Grace trumps legalism. Grace trumps the law. The grace of Jesus is greater than the condemnation of the law. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, is greater than the condemnation of all of the Pharisees who have ever lived in the history of the world. By the law, we are condemned to the pits of hell, but in the grace of Christ, we are saved for all eternity. Mercy triumphs legalism. That is gospel. That is good news. Think about the whole concept of the Sabbath. It's a beautiful concept. God's command to observe the Sabbath going all the way back to creation, going all the way back to the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words of God. God's command to observe the Sabbath in and of itself is really an expression of God's mercy and God's grace. The idea of the Sabbath recognizes the limits of being a human being. The Sabbath allows time for us to care for ourselves and the bodies and the minds that God has entrusted to us. It's, it's an act of grace and mercy. The Pharisees demeaned and they perverted the Sabbath 
by robbing the Sabbath of its rest and by weighing this day and weighing this concept down with legalism, laws on top of laws, rules on top of rules. If the Pharisees had just understood the Sabbath and mercy and grace, they would have never attacked Jesus. But grace and mercy, it just flew right over their heads. The whole idea of the Sabbath was the idea of rest. It's a day of rest. It's a day of grace. It's a day of mercy. It's not a day of rules and laws and, and guidelines. And Jesus took the idea of Sabbath one click further. He said, I am your Sabbath. I am your rest. I am Lord of the Sabbath. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened from all of these laws, and I'll give you rest in my grace. I'll give you mercy. I'll give you peace. We don't much like the Pharisees, but I guess somewhat like them, 2,000 years later, we're still trying to receive and incorporate Jesus' radical transformation of our world and our lives. It's not about law. It's about grace. Herschel Hobbes wrote, A man stands at a fork in the road trying to decide which way to go. One road has a sign which says law. The other road has a sign which says grace. If the person chooses to travel the law road, he falls away from the grace road. It's not a matter of, of that person being in grace and falling out of it. It's a matter of never having been in grace to begin with. Hobbes said, one cannot travel both roads, for law and grace negate each other. If it is by works, then it cannot be by grace. If it is by grace, it cannot be by works. Christ is in the grace road. So if you travel the law road, you're cut off from him and his saving power. To depend upon legalism in any shape, in any form, in any degree, is to turn your back upon Christ. What's the antidote of legalism? How do we ensure that we're not living as practical legalists? It's just this. Love Jesus. Pursue him. Let that be your be-all and in-all following Christ. Just fall in love with Him. Make that the purpose of your life. Seek Him. Pursue Him. Desire Him. Model Him. Worship Him. Pursue a passionate relationship with Him. The oh so great but difficult for us to get message of the gospel and message of, of the kingdom of heaven is that salvation is a gift from God, period. It's about grace. It's about mercy. Not about laws and rules and us working and earning. If you are in Christ, you will never be more acceptable to God than you are in this very moment. The issue is settled. If you're not in Christ, know this. You are not acceptable to God. You cannot be acceptable to God outside of the grace and mercy and forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. The book of 1 John makes it so plainly clear. It says the one who has the Son has life. The one who does not have the Son of God does not have life. It can't be made any more clear. Mercy, 
triumphs legalism. Grace trumps law. There's salvation in Jesus Christ and none other. Would you stand with me as we pray together this morning? Father, we pray in this time of invitation that you would lead us and guide us in the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can come this morning to trust him. You can come this morning to surrender your life to him. You can come this morning to join this church family or to make any decision that God lays upon your heart. Would you come this morning as we sing together?